Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good day, good night. Whatever time it is where you are, hello and welcome. It's good to be with you. Uh, let's get started. It's good to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you always for all the things that you do for us from one day to the next, from one moment to the next. The love, the care, the guidance, the protection that you provide for each of us each and every day. We pray, O oh God, that as we continue to serve you in spirit and in truth, as we continue to reach for you and search for you, we pray that we will find you because we're seeking you with our whole heart. We pray, O oh God, that you would look to us and help us through as we continue to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. Help us as we look into the session that something would be said that would cause us to stop and to think and to be motivated to serve you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let's get started. Uh, let's do our scripture thing. Today is the 17th, uh, so we'll do the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th. So the scripture number 15 is Matthew 5, 14, and it says, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. And number 16 is 2 Timothy 1, 7, 1 verse 7, and it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And number 17 is 1 John 4, 19, which says, We love him because he first loved us. And those are our three scriptures for this evening. Let's get started. Uh, my topic this evening is prepare to receive your reward. Prepare to receive your reward. Rewards, everyone loves them. Everybody loves to be rewarded. We all want to receive a reward, even those rewards which we do not earn, which we have not earned. We want to receive those too. You know, the rewards you received when you have somebody in a high place that can give you a, you know, extra hand up. Yeah. We want to receive rewards sometimes for things that we, we never met the criteria, criteria, we never met the standards, but we still want to receive those rewards. Yeah. We all want to receive rewards, but in the real world, and notice I said the real world, in the real world, it doesn't work that way. Because many of us have attended, you know, those graduation ceremonies like primary school, junior high, high school, college, those elaborate events that celebrate the achievements of the students. We know the moment we step in, the moment we look at the program, we realize that not everyone will be receiving the same reward. No, sir, not at all. Just by the way they are dressed all the color, color coding of their robes and, and the scarves, the different colors and stuff. We know, even by the seating arrangements, we know that everyone, it's clear to see that everyone will not be receiving the same rewards. There will be no one size fit all kind of thing going on. No, people will be rewarded based on what they, what they have accomplished. And there are many other rewards, some some are valedictorian, salutatorian. Some people receive rewards for, you know, the best, most outstanding student in different uh, subject matters and sub topics. And people receive different rewards for different things. And some people receive just the reward to say that you went to college, you know. Yeah, those. And, you know, the students are all excited and they're smiling for the camera as they reflect on the long, long, long hours they spent, you know, trying to get those grades and trying to nail down that assignment. Yes, all that is going through their mind as they're smiling for the camera. Look what my work has brought me to. The moment when I'm all excited and have accomplished so much. Yes, the hard work. They reflect on all of that and they enjoy the moment. Every moment of it, they enjoy that moment. But I wonder where we got the idea from that, you know, people should be rewarded according to their work. Where do you think that came from? Hmm, the idea that each student must be rewarded according to the work that they have done. Well, it came really from our natural senses. 
our sense of justice and fairness and rightness, right and wrong, righteousness, because we all agree, we will all agree that it is just not fair. It's just not fair for the person who slept through half the classes, who hardly ever submitted any assignment, whether they admit, uh, submitted it on time or at all, some have never, don't hardly, um, you know, present or submit assignments. Some don't assign them, some don't um, issue them on time or, or submit them on time. So if you have a student like that who sleeps through class, don't send in their assignments on time or at all, do you think they should receive the same, the same reward as the student who, who works hard, brings excellent work, produces excellent work, and they're in class paying attention every class that there is, every class that they're in, they're paying that and they're paying that attention, that special attention, and doing that extra work. Do they get? Do these people get the same kind of rewards? Is it fair? Even in human nature, is it fair to give each of those persons the same reward based on how they performed? No, we all will agree. That's just not right. That is not right. Everyone will stand and say that's not right. We Believe it or not, we will agree that it is not right. And would you believe that that standard comes from God? That comes from the word of God. It comes from Jehovah. His way of being and doing right or what we would say righteousness, that attitude and that standard comes from the word of God. So here's the all important question. Does Jehovah, does his grading system work the same way? You get what you work for. Is his grading system like that? Hmm. Or does he just love us so much that he just gives us whatever we feel like we should have? Whenever we feel like we should have it, he'll just give us whatever we, our little hearts desire. Well, how do we find the answer to this question? As always, we go to the word of God. We go to the book, to the Bible. In Revelations 22, 11 to 12, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work should be, as his work shall be. Okay. Well, based on this scripture, it appears that there will be different kinds of rewards when we stand before Jehovah. And they will be given, these rewards will be given to every man according to as his work shall be. There will be rewards for everyone. Everyone. And unlike the academic um, celebrations, which allow those who have not met the standard to just opt out of the celebration, they won't be at the celebration because they have nothing to collect. They can opt out of coming to, the, to that celebration at all. But when we stand before Jehovah, everyone will get a reward. Everyone will get a reward. What does it say? He that is unjust, he'll get a reward. This is the reward of the unjust. He that is filthy, this is the reward of the filthy or for the filthy. He that is righteous, this is the reward for the righteous. And he that is holy, this is the reward for those that are holy. So everybody will get an, a reward. Good or bad, you will get a reward. The word of God is saying that when we come to the end of this thing we call life, whatever state we are in, whatever state we are in, that is our final state. When we come to the end of life, whatever state we are in, that is our final state. Whatever we have done with our life, that is the final record of our life. That compilation of our life is the final record. There's no do-overs, there's no edits, none. I saw a powerful video this week of a young man was pouring out some precious drinking bottled water, bottled drinking water, and he was saying that this is the way that we waste our lives, pouring, pouring it out, just extravagantly pouring the water out, pouring it out with no regard for God. His point, his point was that we needed to remember that pouring out our lives with no regards for God, we will give an account for that. 
we will give an account for that. We will have to answer to our creator one day. But there's something else to consider. We would have we would have earned a reward. Just how we poured out the water, we would have earned a reward. We earn a reward for wasting our life. We earn a reward for that too. Because the truth of the matter is that we are all preparing for a reward. Everyone is preparing for a reward. A good reward, a bad reward, all of us are preparing for a reward. What a wonderful reward it's going to be. We all think that. It's going to be a one. I'm going to get a wonderful reward. That wonderful reward is going to, when we think that that wonderful reward is just going to fall into our hands like a ripe plum, plop right in our hands. We've done nothing to get it. Rewards, nothing to get it, but we expect for that reward to just fall into our hands. And this is the most sobering thought for both believers and non-believers alike. For the non-believer, although their personal choice, it's their personal choice to live, you know, in rebellion to Jehovah. That's their choice. Everybody has to make a choice. You make a choice, you live the way you want. You live the way you please. And the thing about it with, with unbelievers, they feel like, you know, their unbelief would change something. You know, I don't believe in God, so it doesn't apply to me. The problem is, one day, we will all stand before the Creator, the Creator of the universe. One day, we'll, we will all stand before Him. And what horror, what horror will grip those who have been tricked into believing that their unbelief, in some way, causes Jehovah to have no consequences for them. They don't believe in Jehovah, so they'll have no consequences. They just live the way they feel like. What a horrible state it's going to be. It's like that person who decides to jump off a 12-story building pr to prove that gravity does not exist. Gravity is not real. I could jump off this building with no consequences. And we all know that despite their unbelief, gravity goes into play. And the consequences are clear for all to see. Everybody gets to see the consequences of that action. But... How sad it will be for those persons when they discover the truth, but they discover it too late. What is worse, that there is no chance of recovery. When you get to that point where you are now regretting a decision, there's no time to turn back. It's too late. It is now payday, and your pay is here. Come collect it. Here is your reward. What it says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. According to the word of God, this will be a permanent condition. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Imagine that. This is very interesting. Just imagine the fearful and the unbelieving. Fearful and unbelieving? Sounds mild, eh? How do these people, who I am sure will claim to be innocent and ignorant, I didn't know any better. I'm innocent. They will be claiming to be innocent. How do they end up in the same place as the sorcerers and the whoremongers. How do they end up in the same place as those that are considered to be the worst of the worst? How do they wind up in the same place as them? You know, like the witch doctors and the obia man and the prostitute and the people we say are the great sinners because, you know, we grade sin. We don't understand the way God sees sin. We, we grade sin, big sins and small sins. How does the little ignorant person who was tricked into believing that lie that there's no God. There's no God. I don't believe in God. So I'm just unbelieving. I'm not wicked. I'm not evil. I just don't believe. So how does he wind up in the same place as the wicked people that we consider wicked people? How do they wind up in the same place? It just does not seem fair to us. Sometimes we consider it just does not seem fair. They are all lumped in with demon worshippers and 
the like. All of them are lumped into the same place. And we see and we understand that Jehovah considers sin, all, all, all unrighteousness is sin. That's what the Bible says. Jehovah considers all of it sin. As far as he's concerned, sin is sin. And there's no grade level with sin. You know, we grade, we grade sin, but there's no grading sin with Jehovah. No kind of sin that's big and no kind of sin that's small. All of it will get you the same reward. And like I say, everyone will get a reward. All sin will be judged equally. 1 John 5.17 says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. What is he saying? He said clearly, all unrighteousness is sin, but some unrighteousness, some sort of sin, some sins can cause us, cause a person their life. Sometimes we commit sins and it costs us our life. Sometimes we commit sin and we keep sinning until we die in that same state of sin. And what is, what is it saying? It's saying that we, the sin was unto death. We kept sinning straight through our lives until we came to a place where we died without repentance. Some people have been wicked all their lives and they continue to live now, continuing in the wicked ways. But some people, you know, they haven't been too bad, you know, they haven't been wicked and all that, but they die without accepting Christ and they die suddenly. So that's a sin unto death. They sinned until their death. And they died without receiving Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Christians need to pay attention because sometimes we think that we can hab habitually sin. We can habitually sin because Jehovah is so, you know, forgiving. And he allows us to do what we want to do. Because we are free moral agents, he just let us do whatever we want to do and we just continue on and on and on. But one thing, we, one thing we have to remember, that one day will be our last day and we don't know which day that is. So, one day we'll have to give an account for that, for what we have done with our lives. If we believe that Jehovah has such a strict grading system, let's ask ourselves this sobering question. What type of reward am I preparing to receive from Jehovah? What type of reward am I preparing to receive from Jehovah? That is a powerful question. It could be, you know, what, what, what am I expecting from him? When I stand before him, what am I expecting? Could, could it be that that place that Jesus is preparing for us, could that be what I'm, I'm building here on earth? Is it based on the life I'm living here? Remember Jesus said he's building a place for us. He will go to prepare a place for us. Well, does that is that connected to the life I'm living here on earth every day, day by day? Are we preparing uh, the place, a reflection of the place by the life that we live? Is he preparing that place based on the life that we're living now by our actions? Our, is he preparing that place based on our action? Is he building a beautiful home on, in the afterlife for us? Is that what he's doing? Or will it be a little one-room shack because we've done, you know, the bare, absolute bare minimum for the kingdom of God? What are we building? There was a statement the old folks would use from time to time. They would say, I'm sending up timber. We're sending up timber. What are they talking about, sending up timber? What they meant was that the service that they were rendering to assist in the building of the kingdom of God, what they're doing here on earth to build the kingdom of God, Jesus was using that as a reflection of the place that he's preparing for them. The way they are living their lives, working in the kingdom and laboring in the kingdom, they are sending that value so that Jesus can build a place for them in glory so that's what they were saying sending up timber i'm sending jesus all the service that he needs to build me a beautiful i'm putting in the work and he's building my mansion based on that work and this is based not only on the service that we render but it's also based on the quality 
of the service that we render. John 14 verse 2 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for us. This is not a joke. This is serious stuff. Jesus says clearly that he's preparing a place for us, that every person who has accepted him as their personal savior, he is preparing a place for us, for you. He is preparing a place for you. But that place will be a reflection of the life that you have lived. Whatever life you've lived, the place he goes to prepare for you as his child, as children of God, the place he prepares for you is based on the work that you've done. Your life, your service, the dedication, the commitment, the self-discipline, all that. And why do you, why do you say, why do you say that? How do you know that? Well, let's take a look back at the scripture that we started with. What does it say? A Revelation 22 verse 12, and it says, And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Wow. This scripture indicates that each of us will occupy the place, a place that reflects the life that we have lived here on earth. According as his work shall be. That's what the scripture says. The place will be according as his work. Your reward will be according as his work shall be. It reminds me of a story I once read about a contractor who gave his boss, who submitted his resignation letter to his boss, informing him that he was ready to hang up his tools and retire. The boss asked him, said to him, I request one thing of you, that you would build one more house for me. Just build one more house and you can hang up your tools. So he decided, okay, I'll build a house for you. But what did he do? He decided to rush through the project, cut corners using inferior materials and paying very little attention to the details, accuracy and making sure everything was level and strong. And he ran through the job, rushed it through, gave shoddy service and shoddy, shoddy supplies and shoddy work. The quality of the work was very low. When the job was completed, the house was completed, everything was done, he went to the boss with the keys because he submitted the, the, the keys to the boss and went to bid him farewell. I'm done building the house. It's all done. Here are the keys. And, when, and that's when the boss handed the keys back to the contractor, handed the keys back to him and informed him that the house that he just completed was all his. It was a gift from the company for his years of service. How that contractor regretted taking those shortcuts, using those inferior, inferior material, not paying attention to the accuracy of the measurements and the proper building codes, how he regretted that. He could have requested the best, most expensive material that would cost him nothing because the contractor, the boss was paying for it. He could have used the best material. He could have given his, made his best job, his last job, his best job. He could have made that last job, his very best job to crown his achievement. But instead he decided to take the low road. So to the saints of God, some of us will be very disappointed in the place that we have built with our lives we will be very disappointed but we won't be able to blame jesus you can't tell jesus he built you a what a one-room shed that's all the material you sent him what the old people say sending up timber that's all the work you sent him he had to build your mansion based on what you sent him he built the place for you with the material the material and the skill that you invested the energy, the time, the labor, the sacrifice that you sent him, he built your mansion with that. He built your place, the place he's going to prepare for each of us. He built your place with the material that you sent him. 
And sometimes we feel like, oh, it's no big deal. So let's ask ourselves, what kind of place am I building? What kind of place, what kind of material am I giving Jesus to build that place for me? To prepare that place for me? What kind of place am I building? We need to be brutally honest when we think about this. Because this is very, very serious. All these years we've been serving in the local church. We've been giving lip service. Talking, talking, talking and doing no work. No real diligence or passion. No dedication or commitment. We've just been duped into thinking that we are serving the pastor. I doing all this for the pastor. I serving and slaving for the members. We do not realize that one day we will see the true value of the work that we've done. The true value of it. Not the fake, fluffy, propped up thing. But the true value. The heart that was behind it. The dedication, the passion that was behind what we did. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9 to 15 says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if, any, now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Wow. I'm telling you, this is serious business. Some of us will be filled with such shame and regret when we stand before Jehovah. When we realize that we were not hurting anyone but ourselves. We wasn't hurting the pastor. We wasn't hurting the members. We were hurting ourselves. When we decide to sleep in on Sundays, when we know that Jehovah has called us to serve in our local churches, to be in place on Sunday morning, but we decide to sleep in. The Sunday service is completely out of sync because half of the choir decided they're gonna, they can't be bothered. Not this morning, it's raining. It's cold. Last Sunday was cold. It's cold. I can't be bothered. The usher is cranky and snappy with the members and the visitors because he decided to stay out late on Saturday night. Now he's tired and miserable, so he drags himself into the house of God out of obligation. Not out of passion, not out of love, not out of sacrifice, but out of obligation. Not out of love for God. When we teachers do not bother to study the Sunday lesson, Sunday school lesson, so we have no inspiration from the Holy Spirit to share with the students, what do we do? We just fake it and come up with something and throw something together. Jehovah is going to deal with all this foolishness when we stand before him. We're going to have to give an account. We better get our act together because we will be we will need to give him an account of what we were doing. And like the Bahamians say, the children would say, we gotta straighten up and fly right. We all want wonderful and great and blessing, 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 and showers of blessing. But what do we want to do? You want to give Jehovah the scraps and still expect the blessing, blessing, blessing. And what we, we act like, he better be glad we even show up. Pastor better be glad I show up. They better be glad I show up. You're not hurting anybody. You're hurting yourself. You're not hurting, you're not hurting the church. 
because the church belongs to Jesus Christ. And if you don't do it, he'll find somebody else that will. So who loses? You lose. The children will say, keep it up. Go ahead, keep it up. Payday coming. And there's one bone chilling morning in the book of Revelations. And it's in Revelations chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And it says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou, thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast, and hast patient, patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That's scary. That is scary. Remove your candlestick. Jesus is speaking to the to John the Revelator. And he's giving this church a commendation along with a stern warning. He said, I know your works. You can't stand evil and you shun evil and and you don't like people who are wicked and all this kind of stuff and you try to um, you know, avoid them and try to walk straight and everything. But what is he saying? He has something still against them. Against them. He says that they must repent. If they refuse to repent, he will remove their candlestick, their source of light. And move, removing their source of light will obstruct their ability to see clearly, which would result in spiritual blindness. If you can't see properly by the light of the word of God, you go into spiritual blindness. This is a picture of the Latter-day Church. The church that we are in today and the church going forward to the future because the coming of the Lord is so near, we are the Latter-day Church. So this is referring to the Latter-day Church. We can all see clearly how dark the world is becoming. Imagine having no light. The light of God has been removed because you refuse to repent. No light of God's word. No light of Christ. In your, you know, because we learn from each other. We benefit from the light each of us bring. But if the light is gone, that means you have to maintain your own light. Because you have no other light to see. You better maintain your own light. So having somebody there that's a strong light for the kingdom of God... Jesus said, we will remove your candlestick. He will remove their candlestick. Why is he going to remove their candlestick though? He says, because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. Now, anyone who's ever been in love, know how passionate and hot and powerful, powerful that first love can be. Man, that's, that's some hot love. That first love is some hot, hot love. You stay up all night on the phone. You walk for miles to see each other. You buy expensive gifts that you can't afford. Yeah. Because nothing, 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 absolutely nothing is too good for the one you love so much. Your first love. That's some hot love. And that is what the relationship, what our relationship is like when we first gave our life to Jesus Christ. Remember the passion? Remember the passion and the desire? Our first love. We served him with gladness. We served the Lord with gladness. We listen um what um David said in Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Yes, that passion. That passion that we had for Lord, for the Lord to serve him. We never missed a service. We were at prayer meeting, Bible study, street meeting. 
everything we could have done for the Lord. We were there on time, present, early. Sorry, yes, sir. When we first met Jesus Christ, when we first gave our life to Jesus Christ. And what happened? What happened? As the years rolled by, we took our eyes off him. We started looking around for promotions and accolades and all that stuff. Yeah. We got all tangled up in church politics, in the politics of the church, playing religious games, all the while losing, losing, losing our reward, losing our reward, giving lackluster service because we so disillusioned with what the people in the church doing and all upset. So we, we cut back on our service to God because of what people do. God ain't do you nothing, but you cut back because of what people do you politics of church some people even wind up losing their souls over foolishness like that take their eyes off of christ altogether started out so good but took their eyes off of christ and now disaster playing religious games jesus said in verse 5 remember therefore from whence thou hast fallen and repent and do the first works go back to being in church being at your station every time the church is open you may say that's weird I, I can't be there all the time you're at work every day early working late working overtime to make that money we can do everything we desire to do Anything we put our heart to do, anything that we're passionate about, we can do it. We can get it done. We can get it done. Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example. We must be the same as he is. Strive to be the same as he is. The intensity which with, with which he served the Father, that must be our intensity. John 9 verse 4 says this is jesus speaking i must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the night cometh when no man can work i need to read that again saint john chapter 9 verse 4 i must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the night cometh when no man can work no man can work and sometimes the bible speak of night and sleep and that's death what it's talking about the night cometh when you close your eyes in death that's night for you go to sleep until jesus comes until he calls you out of the grave the night cometh when no man can work it is easy to remain focused and continue to press through is that a true statement that it's difficult no it is not easy. It is not easy to press through. Not at all. Because the days we are now living in are evil days. Evil days. So much junk going on in the churches. It's just like some people are just getting away with murder in the church. Getting away with whatever they want. All kind of foolishness in the church. All the while claiming, to be the, claiming that they are serving God. All kind of foolishness that they are serving God. But the wonderful thing about Jehovah is that he cannot be fooled. He cannot be tricked. He sits high and looks low and nothing escapes his gaze. So each of us will give an account of our own lives. No one can stop us from serving Jehovah with all our passion, with all our dedication, with all that's in us. No one can stop us from serving Jehovah in that fashion. If you find that someone is obstructing you, find something else to do. Pray and ask Jehovah. I want to serve you in spirit and in truth, but it's difficult in this place where I am. Either change me or change the situation so that I can serve you better. He just, his ears are upon the righteous and his, eye, his eyes are upon the righteous and his ears are open to our cry. Whenever we call on him, he answers. He is there to make sure that we fulfill the purpose for which he sent us here. No one can stop us from serving Jehovah with all our hearts. And if we decide to be slackers and busybodies in the kingdom of God, 
then we choose to do it at our own loss, our own peril. We're not hurting anybody else but ourselves, not hurting anyone else. But one thing is sure, there will be no mix-up with regards to our rewards. There will be no mix-up. Jehovah keeps accurate records. He cannot be deceived. And so, saints, I challenge you. I challenge you. As servants of the Most High God, it's time for us to man our battle stations. It's time for us to get where we're supposed to be and stay there. Put on the whole armor of God because we're going to definitely need it in these days and time. We need to work like there's no tomorrow. Work like there's no tomorrow because there very well may not be. We do not know where death is. Tomorrow is promised to no man, so we really don't know. We don't mind the noise in the market. Don't mind the noise. Don't mind the babbling and the rambling about what color Jesus is and whether God is a man or a woman, or whether the rapture is coming pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, all these bunch of foolishness that we fuss and row and carry on and get distracted by. Don't pay no attention to them. Ignore all that because all it is is a distraction. That's all the enemy trying to distract you. It is all meant to waste your time and get you off course. Ignore it. Ignore all of that. I told some folks this week that there are some things, some things, some questions that I don't have answers for. I have decided to put them in a box, marked, ask Jesus when I see him. Anything I don't understand, I put it in the box, put it in that mental box. I will ask Jesus when I see him. I don't have time to focus on the unsure i don't know it can't be proven i don't have time for that too many things that can be proven we can focus on focus on those things don't focus on them because number one i don't have the answers and number two they have no bear no bearing on my salvation or on my reward whether jesus come post-trip mid-trip pre-trip that ain't gonna have no if i haven't done the work I will not get my reward. So it doesn't matter when he comes. But if I've done the work, if we have done our work, whenever he comes, he will find us ready. Like the five virgins that had oil in their lamps. Yes, he'll find us like them. Prepared and ready to meet him. All that stuff could wait until I see Jesus. Until we see Jesus, we could straighten that out with him when we see him. But right now, we must get our work done. We must get our work done because if we want to hear well done, we have to work and our work must be well done. In order to hear well done, we must do well done. Do our work and do it well. So it's time for us to come on now. Put on the whole armor of God. Strap on those gospel boots good and tight and start marching. Time is running out. We don't have time to be joking around. We say, his coming draweth nigh. Yes, his coming draweth nigh. He says, even at the door, pay attention. He's coming and he's coming for you. Just make sure you're not like the foolish virgins. I encourage you that whether we are among the dead that rise first, or we are caught up from this earth when Jesus comes in the clouds, you must, we must, make good use of the time that we have remaining the remaining time we have to serve the lord we must make good use of that time and keep our eyes on the prize keep our eyes on the prize and prepare to receive your reward prepare to receive your reward and sometimes we look and we wonder why we have to go to church every sunday and People would ask us, you go to church every Sunday. Why you have to go to church every Sunday? You know what to tell them? I'm working on my place. I'm working on my place. I want a good place. I want Jesus to build me a wonderful place. So I have to do wonderful works. 
wonderful works from a wonderful from a heart of love and thanksgiving and praise and worship i must do a good work from a good heart why you go to prayer meeting so much why you go to bible study so much why you can't stop talking about jesus we are working on a place that's what we're doing working on a place we all must prepare to receive our reward god bless you bless you thank you so much for joining me let me pray and close heavenly father i thank you we thank you for that beautiful place that jesus has gone to prepare for us we pray father that we would continue to remember that you will reward us according to our work according to the quality of our work the quantity of our work you will record we will reward us for what we have done we will receive no reward for the work that we fail to do or neglected to do so father help us to put our shoulders to the wheel and continue to press as the apostle paul admonish admonishes us press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling and when we are tired and weary and running out of strength and discouraged and beaten down lord help us to just look to you and pray and call on you and ask you to help us because you are right with us every step of the way you said behold i am with you always even unto the end of the age father by your spirit you are always with us because you live in us by your holy spirit so as we continue to press lord help us to remember that jesus bore the cross all the way he suffered completely the least we can do for him is give him our best help us guide us direct us protect us we pray in the name of jesus christ your son amen amen and amen god bless you bless you thank you so much for joining me it was a pleasure to be with you this evening i pray that something i said resonated with you um it blessed you you were able to glean some knowledge some further knowledge or some confirmation of things that you already know god bless you thank you once again for joining me and like i always say you could have been doing anything else but you decided to spend these moments with me thank you ever so much and may jehovah continually bless your life goodbye